records that are turned over by an individual um, have suffered from the same problem. Quite often the police will simply accept an invoice from someone who claims to have been uh, ripped off by, by someone else and later when he's presented with that invoice in the witness stand, he really hasn't got a clue whether that was his uh, or where it came from. He remembers he turned something over to the police, but that's about the extent of it. So again, the police have to be careful when they accept something from uh, an individual that they get them to mark on it uh, something that will refresh their memory later when it's put to them in the stand. And just a word on the computer printouts in the McMullen case. That case firstly established the principle that a computer printout is a record for the purposes of uh, Section 29. But the court also did suggest that in proving computer printouts as record, the, the Crown is under a heavy onus to put forth evidence of the f complete record keeping process of the computer, the procedures relating to input, storage, retrieval and presentation. And in a case where the computer, where the record itself is, is kept within the computer, that is going to be a very uh, difficult hurdle for the Crown to get over. But insofar as McMullen seems to indicate that's the way banks in Canada work, it is not correct, as I think later cases are going to show. In McMullen, there had been no evidence led with respect to the procedure that was used. In Canada, the way the banks uh, operate is the, the computer printout itself becomes their record. Uh, they get a piece of paper, which is the printout, and they make that their own bank record. So it's not a case that the computer that any of the banks use keeps the record inside. It produces a record, which then becomes the record of the bank. Uh, some cases that are under appeal now, I think, are going to clarify that so that if, if on reading it you think that uh, you're in a, an excellent position to keep out bank records just because they're computer records, you have to be very, very careful because the evidence that may ultimately be led uh, by the, the Crown through the manager or accountant is going to establish that that piece of paper, that computer printout, is the actual record itself. Therefore. According to Section 29, there'd be no need to uh, to go behind it. Zach, just on the, the some of the problems that uh, are encountered by crowns in relation to the police seizure documents, what are you doing to rectify those problem areas? Well, every police officer, of course, has to be conscious of the fact that the documents that he's seizing on a particular day, four years down the road, might be entered in, in court as, as evidence. And so you, you have to keep that in mind. And in, in small seizures, it's, it's very easy to, to deal with a, a one file or one document and so on and keep possession and continuity of, uh, of the document. What happens is in, in large searches where you're, you're talking about using 50 to 75 people and, you're, and you can end up getting 150 to 200 boxes worth of documents from, from 40 locations in, in three provinces, which, which can happen. And just to reassure your honor, we do take a lot of care not to go on a uh, fishing expedition after consulting with the Crown. The, uh, we, <laughs> we always do it at, uh, Oh, I believe. But what uh, what we do as a practice in our office, anyways, and you got to remember each police department uses their own system or method, and a lot of times it varies from investigator to investigator because certain investigators like to use certain procedures in, se in seizing documents. Other investigators have their own method. But what always happens is there's there's a, uh, a quite a detailed briefing before any kind of a large search is. Uh, is initiated, then that can take anywhere from half a day to a day where the, the investigators will brief all the, uh, the various policemen who are there who are going to conduct the search. And a lot of times you have members from other sections, members from other police departments who are assisting on the, on the search. And until they get there, they know nothing about your case. So you've got to tell them what your case is about, and you've got to 
sort of interest them in, in the case and deal specifically with the location and the particular documents that you're going to want from the area where they're going to be searching. And what if there are two or three people or more going to a particular location, you designate one, we, we designate one person as the exhibit officer. So if he goes to a particular office and there's 10 rooms in that office, three people are searching, they will all search, but the one exhibit officer, he does nothing but record where are the boxes of documents in out of what cabinet they're coming out of. So he, he marks down exactly where these documents are coming out of. He takes possession of those documents there. Once he puts them in the boxes, he is required to mark them. He's required to mark what officer seized what documents or filled what box from a particular office. In, in many instances, we use IDENT people to photograph the location, to, to do a floor plan drawing. We try to ensure as much as possible that we have some continuity of the exhibits. Once the exhibit officer at the location where the search is conducted takes those documents and brings them back to headquarters or wherever the investigators are, if you have an investigative team, usually one person will be designated, again, as the exhibit officer who will take the exhibits from the person who was the exhibit officer at the scene. He will mark and record the turnover of the documents, and he will, he will seal them, put them in a room, and that's where the, the investigators subsequently will be going to, to look at the documents, to examine them, and to, uh, to mark them. Unfortunately, in a lot of cases, you don't have the luxury of having one room per, per every case that's investigated. So you do have uh, maybe five cases, uh, exhibits pertaining to five cases in one room, and everybody has to have access to that room. Uh, in a lot of cases, you'll, um, you've seized documents from a company. The accountant wants certain documents from that company. He'll come in. He wants to work on those documents. You have to give him access to those documents. A third party might have certain files that were at the, uh, at the particular location. He wants to look at his documents, or, or she wants to look at her documents. You have to give access to, to that. That causes a problem, because you've got to have somebody there who's with them all the time. You've got to make sure that you know, they, they can't come at any time of the day, knock on the door, and say, I want to I want to work on my papers for, uh, you know, for four hours. So those kinds of problems arise, and we try and do the best we can to make sure that from the moment the exhibits are seized, we can, until the time that they're entered in court, that we can show a continuity of the documents from the various members. Okay. Doug, moving on to the topic of forensic accounting, uh, can you just outline for us briefly what are the permissible limits of the forensic accountant? The issue has been conclusively decided in Ontario by the Court of Appeal in a case called Regina versus Scheel. That was a case involving 11 counts of uh, fraud on a man who ran a company that built pallets, wooden pallets for uh, for farmers to store their produce in. The case was really the classic uh, case of bad business versus fraud in the sense that the Crown had to concede on the evidence that up to a point in time he was simply a bad businessman. But after a point in time he realized that his operation had gone so far downhill that when he continued to accept orders from farmers for these boxes and accept payment for them, he knew he had no intention and really no ability to provide them for him. The only ground uh, that the Court of Appeal dealt with on Shields' appeal against conviction was the admissibility of summaries introduced by the Crown through an accountant. The case had involved somewhere between 100 and 150 exhibits and uh, a considerable number of witnesses, farmers who had placed orders at various times and paid money for them and had received, in some cases, part delivery and in other cases, no delivery. The accountant took the exhibits, the oral testimony of 
some of the Crown witnesses, a, an agreed statement of fact as between Crown and defense in respect of other witnesses, and the preliminary transcript of the, the transcript of the preliminary inquiry, which was read in in the case of some witnesses who had died. From those pieces of evidence, he produced uh, a number of summaries of the evidence, which uh, on themselves involved nothing but in themselves involved nothing but a, a reproduction from the face of documents and from the oral testimony, certain of the of the evidence, but put it in a form that was. Uh, chronological and easy to understand. The position of the defense was that the uh, original documents which were in his exhibits and the evidence was the best evidence and therefore these schedules uh, weren't admissible. Secondly, that they would simply overwhelm the jury. The Court of Appeal held that the summaries were admissible. They were admissible for the purpose of assisting the jury in understanding the entire picture and they had only so much weight as the jury gave to them based on their decision as to whether or not the facts uh, had been proved. If they rejected certain of the evidence of people who had testified, then the summaries themselves became useless because all the summaries did was reproduce that evidence in a, in a more understandable way. But uh, the court in the final result held that Summaries of that type are uh, helpful to the jury and uh, indeed admissible. So I take that to be the position in Ontario now that uh, as long as the, the summaries accurately reflect the evidence as given in any one of a number of forms, they'll, they'll be admissible. Ralph, uh, assuming that uh, you're the accountant uh, retained to hopefully assist either the prosecution or the defense, uh, what can you do to help? Well, <clears throat> you're in the field of, as you call it, forensic accounting. I think that that's a misnomer. I hope everyone has a, this graphic that we put out because it'll save me an awful lot of words. If you haven't, I've got plenty up here. As far as I'm concerned, you're talking about an expert who was giving testimony at a point of time. I think that there is a tremendous need for a litigation accountant who, if you want a better definition for it, is a litigation lawyer with numbers attached, who will assist you on a teamwork basis from day one throughout to the point of time where you either have a settlement or you go to trial. He can assist you only in his area of expertise and presumably he's expert in the areas of economic mishaps. I don't care whether he knows how to take numbers, he knows how to use numbers, he knows how to apply numbers, and he's in position to be of a real assistance to you. I broke it down on a systems chart and I said the first thing, how can we help? Can't do a darn thing unless I understand the problem from your point of view. And I sit with you and I say, what is the problem? What's the charge? What happened? Where are you coming from? If you're the defense, where's the crown coming from? What's the strength and weakness of your argument? What's the strength and weakness of theirs? And then I'm beginning to get an idea of where I'm going. Remember, I'm talking about economic crime, or I'm talking about very complicated issues. Maybe it's a securities fraud with international, hopefully, because I enjoy traveling. Once we get into the problem area, I want to know what you expect from me and how do you expect it? When do you want it? Do you want it graphically? Because I think you can reduce most of your cases to no more than three or four pages of graphics. Flow charting, if you want to call it that. Graphics simply tells you schematically where you are, where you're going, where the strengths and weaknesses are. I have that. And the only real contribution we could make is we understand business. We understand the business reality. We've been there so many times. If we've grown up through the audit ranks, we've made so many mistakes given advice to clients. We watch our clients make so many mistakes. We actually learn something about business. And once we understand the business, we then can understand anomalies, what happens that are different what pieces of paper are going to jump out at you at a point of time that says, 
this thing doesn't belong here or this thing means something else altogether. So I don't start with expert testimony and I do not start with developing a particular block of material on request. That's like something akin to being a designated batter. When you're over the hill, you can be a designated batter and you can hit from time to time if you still enjoy the game. I like to feel that we get into the whole game. The whole game starts with the definition of the problem. Then you can go into your key transactions. Then you can go into your issues, your events, your people. What happened? Who made it happen? How do pieces of paper flow through the system? What pieces of paper are important? What pieces of paper can you ignore? You can focus in. That prevents you from making magnitude errors or getting lost in the bushes. In each case, you keep constantly running back to you, uh, Neil, and you say, what does this mean? And there's a constant interchange because you're applying the law and you're applying your knowledge of the law to uh, what I pick up in the way of financial information. How much does it cost? How much money do you have? <laughs> is, it, is it fantastically expensive, honestly? No. No, it is not because you're focusing in. Uh, Doug tells me that the, the average charge that he has experienced is in the $50 an hour range. I think that we, because we focus in, we know where we're going before we start. We pretty well have a knowledge of the business based on too many years of practical experience. We can zero in rather quickly. I've done them for less than $1,000 and I've done, done them for a much higher number than that. Judge Colleen, assuming that uh, you're acting for the defense and you've retained uh, Ralph Fisher, uh, you want to ensure his access to the materials uh, held by Zach here, how do you go about it? Well, the, uh, I suppose the problem can be described this way, that uh, there are rights that you have believe it or not, under the criminal code. And uh, your starting points, as I see it, are the uh, search warrant provisions. And uh, if you look at section 446 of the criminal code, there's uh, a subsection which says this, where anything is detained under sub one, that's the order of detention by the uh, JP, a judge of a superior court or a uh, court of criminal jurisdiction, that's a county court in the situation, may on summary application on behalf of a person who has an interest in what is detained after three, three clear days notice to the AG order that the person by or, or on whose behalf the application is made be permitted to examine anything so detained. So you have that right built into that code of rights and obligations. And also above that section there is a section where the justice of the peace uh, can direct after a hearing either ex parte or on notice to both sides can direct that documents be returned to the suspect or the accused or the target as the case may be. Then you have your rights of particulars under section 516 I think it is of the code. And uh, that's a, a forgotten section as it seems to me. And if you look at section 516 it provides for a sophisticated and broad ranging uh, entitlement to uh, particulars. And the first words of that section are important. The court may, where it is satisfied that, is that it is necessary for a fair trial, order the prosecutor to furnish particulars, and so on. And it gives some specific entitlements. The, the word court there has been construed in a Western judgment, Pope reported in the CCCs in 1978, has been construed as embracing the uh, broad trial court in which the, tri the uh, charge is going to be processed and not the trial judge. And I think that's the correct interpretation of that section and that's the way I interpret it and have applied it in cases in uh, Middlesex. So that you have a broad right to get particulars from the court and not from the trial judge at the day the trial opens, in my view, and it seems to me that that section has been manifestly underutilized by the bar, the defense bar. And as I say, section 446, 445 and 6, uh, to which I just adverted, 
also contain similar rights. So you have, it seems to me, statutorily, a broad right to get access to these documents. Thank you. Doug, uh, let me just ask you, from your experience, uh, are there cases to which the forensic accountant is more suited than others? I think there are cases where you can get uh, uh, a, the maximum benefit out of a forensic accountant in the sense that you call him as a witness and he puts in exhibits that assist you with the jury assist and assist the jury. I think there are other cases where the forensic accountant plays a lesser role but perhaps a, an equally valuable role. They can be retained merely as advisors uh, on the financial transactions to help the police and the Crown understand what went on. They can help the Crown prepare certain witnesses to examine in chief. They can help the Crown prepare to cross-examine certain witnesses. Uh, I think the cases where you get the maximum use out of a forensic accountant is where there, the evidence is is lengthy, uh, voluminous, in the sense of the, the number of documents that have gone in, and at the same time, the jury is going to be asked to draw inferences from the documents and the transactions that are reflected there that go right to the issue of guilt or innocence. There are cases where we retain the services of an accountant and following his examination, we conclude that really the financial transactions that took place aren't going to be the nub of the fraud. Uh, we may decide we're not even going to call evidence of that, and if defense wishes to, they may. Uh, in those cases, the account accountant tends to drop out of the picture at a certain stage, but where you uh, have a, a case that in order to be understood, you have to simplify it at the end of the Crown's case and at the end of the whole case, then I think you're in a position to uh, really put the forensic accountant to the test. The handout that you got as you came in, in with the green cover is contains two sets of summaries prepared by Bob Lindquist of Lindquist and Holmes and these were actual exhibits in two cases. The first set are, contains some of the exhibits from the Shield prosecution and the second set contain uh, some of the schedules from a prosecution, Regina versus Carl Rosen and John Macabroda, for a classic bankruptcy fraud. The purpose in giving you these was to try and uh, give you some visual guide to the impact that they can have in a difficult fraud case. Now, I've given you part of the facts of the Shiel case. If you can try and put yourself into a trial that went for more than a month and involved uh, over a hundred documents, many of which were invoices to Shield's company, many invoices from Shield to the farmers for the, for the boxes. There were checks from the farmers back to Shield. There were banking records. The witnesses, of course, weren't called in any particular chronological order. They gave uh, evidence as to their conversations with them and in addition they tendered what documents they had. At the end of the the Crown's case there was no evidence called. It was really a, a big ball that had to be sorted out before the jury could be expected to come to any conclusion on any issue beyond a reasonable doubt. So the first schedule that went in in that case, and the most important one, is, is found at A1 and A2. This was a much bigger schedule at the trial, and it was all on one piece of paper. But if you look across, you can see that what the accountant has done in this case is taken the, the name of the witness and placed it down the left-hand side, and then across uh, the page, he has put the information that essentially that witness gave. Now, there are not, there's, there's no note as to the statements that were made by Scheel to the witness, but that came out in oral evidence. He took information from the invoices in the first three or four columns concerning the date of the order, the number of uh, boxes ordered, and the amount. 
The expected delivery date came sometimes from the invoice, sometimes from the Viva Voce testimony of the witness. Customer payments, the information there came from the checks of the customers and Shields bank records. He made certain calculations such as total payments. Uh, the number of boxes delivered came from invoices and uh, Viva Voce evidence. Then he made certain further calculations on the right hand side showing as the month of August progressed the number of unfilled orders that uh, were accumulating. Now it was critical in this case because the Crown was conceding that up to, the, to a point in early August Scheel was simply a very bad businessman. But after that point in time he realized he couldn't pr produce and he did, had no intention of producing yet he still was accepting the money. So here on those first two pages the accountant really took all of the very difficult evidence of, uh, of those witnesses, evidence that the jury would never have remembered and would never have sorted out. And he put it in a, in a format that was very easy for them to understand, very easy for them to, uh, to check. In fact, in that case, the jury was invited, uh, both by the Crown and the trial judge, to test the accountant's summaries by taking the individual exhibits and matching them to what the information he had here. The accountant, as he was putting in this, gave the exhibit number of each document that he used. The jury was out some 29 hours, and they, it was eventually learned that what they did was they actually took the 100 to 150 exhibits, they matched them up with his schedules, and checked out each of his entries to ensure that it was accurate. Once they'd done that, they were able to set aside those exhibits and they worked strictly from the schedules. The next two pages, A3 and A4, go together and they're an example of a very interesting type of schedule that an accountant can prepare that's very effective. At A3, you have a document that is in Shield's own handwriting or the handwriting of uh, his accountant but prepared at his, on his instructions. And in this, he told a lie to the bank in order to get an extension on the loan. And the lie consisted of the column where he suggested that he had a certain amount of the order completed and delivered. It's the second column from the right. And you'll notice that he was claiming to have already completed and delivered, uh, in most cases, 50% and up to 100% of the boxes, suggesting to the bank that uh, he had a lot of work in process and that he was expecting more money in. If you look at A4, this is the schedule prepared by the accountant from, from the actual evidence. And it matches Shields' uh, document except for the column where there was, uh, he'd recorded evidence of percentage complete and delivered. You see from looking at this that aside from the last four items which the Crown was not in a position to prove and conceded to Shield that maybe he had done that, Virtually every case, he recorded a lie. Now, again, the jury would never have been able to have remembered the evidence with respect to what Scheele had completed and delivered, and only by means of a, a chart like this that contrasted what the actual evidence was to what Scheele's evidence was, was the Crown able to highlight the uh, discrepancy between the two. In that case, I think there's there is no doubt in anyone's mind that what, was it not for the accountant's evidence and these schedules, there would never have been a conviction. But based on them, the jury was able to lay aside all the difficult problems of sifting through the evidence and then come to grips with the real issue, and that was what was his intent after the first part of August. Now, the next case uh, starts at B1, and it's what I think... I can safely say is the classic textbook plan bankruptcy. Uh, two fellas, Rosen and Macabroda, were running an antique business in Toronto. The, the year for which, the last year for which there were any financial statements indicated that in the whole year they, they purchased a total of $90,000 worth of antiques and sold most of them. In January of 75, they set out to accumulate a tremendous inventory uh, of merchandise that was only in part antiques. Much of it was modern furniture that they'd never dealt in before. It was all ordered during the first few months of, of 1975, 
and uh, it was set to be delivered within about a one week period at the beginning of April. If you look at the schedule on B1, this distilled uh, over 500 pages of invoices from suppliers to Rosen and Macaroda. They went in on the basis uh, that they were business records and the Crown was prepared to call uh, between 75 and 80 witnesses to prove them but uh, an agreement was worked out between Crown and Defence whereby they were simply admitted as business records. Now here the jury could never on their own have gone through those business records and, and deduced just how much these fellows had ordered in that short period. The top half of that schedule shows that in the first five months they ordered four hundred and eleven thousand dollars worth of, of inventory. Uh, again you have to bear in mind that in the last complete year they did business for which they had financial records they'd ordered only ninety thousand. In the same period of time between January and June they only paid ten thousand dollars to the to the people from whom they had ordered it. This schedule then uh, put the Crown in a position of showing just what the nature of the business was during those first critical months. Rosen and Macabroda planned to have the merchandise delivered in early April and at that time they planned to sell it off very quickly at cost uh, or slightly above cost. Now you bear in mind they were pay making no payments to the creditors so what they would obviously do was then uh, become solvent very quickly and have a tremendous amount of money at their disposal. They had to get the money out of the company bank account and so that in involved uh, another classic step in a textbook bankruptcy and that is to bring in a third party who uh, will later be blamed with uh, having absconded with the funds. So they put an ad in the star for an accountant uh, to come and do their books and a, a chap from Mississauga made application and submitted his resume and he never heard again from them but within a couple of days his resume showed up at the company's bank in the hands of a man with a a Boston accent that Rosen and McElroy introduced as the accountant uh, from Mississauga. Um, he was their, uh, their assistant who had come up to play the role of the accountant. He got signing authority and he was the man that uh, in effect handled all the cash from there on in. Um, if you look at B2 you'll see a summary of just what happened insofar as the money they received for the payment of uh, goods they sold is concerned. They received the total and this is, is all in the period from April 15th to May 17th, that's about one month, $245,000. The customers who bought the merchandise from them are listed. They all bought it at cost and strangely enough they were friends of uh, Rosen and Macabroda, but they had receipts. Now of the 245,000, 109 came in cash and that never saw the company bank account. The receipts all indicated that Mr. Geslack, who uh, is, was the name being used by the chap from Boston, had accepted payment in full in cash and uh, of course he wasn't around so we didn't know where it went. The checks that they received did go into the bank, but as you'll see in a moment, they also came out at the hand of Mr. Geslack. But what this schedule did then was take the evidence of uh, about half a dozen witnesses with respect to their purchases and put it in a form that the jury could understand. They were able now to see that what the Crown had showed, in addition to all the purchases the company had made, was that they sold this tremendous amount of goods in a one-month period about half the money came in in cash and never saw the bank and the other half saw the bank. Uh, but it wasn't in there for long. As a matter of fact, by the end of May there was $4.39 in the bank. Now, the next stage in this case where the accountant played a vital role was in assisting us to prove that the merchandise was sold by the two accused at cost. So the schedule at B3 shows 
uh, on the left hand side the invoice from uh, the two accused to one of their friends for merchandise that they sold them. On the right hand side the same merchandise, this, this is reproduced from an invoice to the company from the supplier showing that they in this particular case sold merchandise to RNG Enterprises, their friend, which they had bought at exactly the same cost they were selling it. Uh, there were five, over 500 documents that had to be, uh, invoices that had to be gone through and matched up with the sales invoices by the two accused. That could never have been done by a jury. The final two schedules dealt with the way the money uh, that went into the bank during that period was handled. You see at the top uh, about 140,000 went in and at the bottom about 140,000 went out. <laughs> it went out in cash either to Geslac or it went out to, uh, to Geslac relatives of the two accused, uh, companies that the two accused had, and uh, left uh, an amount of four dollars in the bank at the end of the month. The last schedule showed the number of NSF checks they wrote to suppliers, all dated after May the 20th, at which point in time they had about a thousand dollars in the bank. So in effect, through the schedules, all of the evidence, which was basically documentary evidence, was reduced to a a state that the jury could understand, could go through, and uh, eventually come to the conclusion with respect to intent. Uh, Ralph, uh, just by way of, of comment, uh, assuming, assuming you're acting for the defense, and, uh, or I'm acting for the defense, and I've retained you, and uh, I have a case where I'm provided with schedules such as this, uh, and I come to you, uh, do you, lie, do you lie down and play dead? Do, do numbers lie? Well, they say that uh, figures do not lie, but liars figure. But both statements are probably incorrect. I think numbers do lie, because you don't know what the numbers are, why they were prepared, and what they were pur purported to, uh, to mean. Let's take a financial statement. Incidentally, this is the first time, Doug, I've ever heard that the accountant did it. Up to then, it was always the butler. <laughs> And I will wager that that chap from Boston was a butler. <laughs> well, actually, he was later found jogging on the beach in, in Massachusetts and, and uh, extradited back, and, and he was <laughs> prosecuted as well. The term you're looking for is not the numbers lie. The term you're looking for is creative ac accounting. I pulled this out of a uh, book yesterday. I'm sorry, I can't remember the book. Uh, I Xerox it. I didn't steal the book. The dispute over the disappearing profits of Charlie's Angels has focused attention on creative accounting, hyphen Hollywood style. The term includes not only bookkeeping shenanigans, but also a host of other methods, legal and illegal, that some studios, production houses, and exhibitors use to enrich themselves. Our Los Angeles office tells me, and they've told it to me time and time again, that they, whenever they go out, on a royalty audit, they always make their fees plus. <laughs> so that will give you the answer to the should you check numbers. In the court case, definitely. Uh, let's take a financial statement. The financial statement, you've got a certificate, there's an auditor's certificate, and it says on the bottom it sets out fairly. That has absolutely nothing to do with the charge. Yes, the financial statement sets out fairly. It's a measurement of income. The measurement of income is within three to five percent. The assets are within a, a range that's acceptable depending on which time of the year you read general accepted accounting principles. But that doesn't mean anything. Let's assume the charge is that between January the 1st and June the 15th, and I'm not picking these dates out of thin air, it's an actual charge that I read, uh, inventory shrinkage was. The facts are that most firms when they have a December the 31st year end, count stock either in October or November. They adjust their inventory at that time and they assume that there's going to be the same inventory adjustment and they use the same inventory adjustment for the next two months and they start as January the 1st. Nobody counted stock on January the 1st. Nobody's in position to say 
what the shortfall is. They can talk about the fairness of the shortfall, the fairness of presentation, but on a dollars and cents basis, nobody can tell me what the inventory is January the 1st. You can roll forward, you can roll backwards, you can roll on your head, but I tell you that if the inventory is complicated, and if we're in an area particularly where we're in manufacturing, there's a gap that you can drive a truck through. I think you not only should challenge numbers, I think you have a professional obligation to challenge numbers. You challenge witnesses, you challenge documents, why are you intimidated with numbers? We were in a case in Windsor where there was an inventory, allegation of an inventory fraud of a, some, something in the neighborhood of one million dollars. When we were through, we had an inventory overstatement of $28,000. We challenged those numbers. And when we demonstrated that we took some mild exception to the claim of a million dollar shortfall, uh, or we were challenged by the Crown in that instance with 12 different surveys, all doing a left nostril statistical survey, moving from that and reaching a conclusion. The survey represented 1%, the conclusion they tried to represent the total population. They could not do it statistically. Every one of their surveys could be challenged, and in fact, in most cases, their surveys proved exactly the opposite. I think that you should challenge numbers in every single instance. Judge Colleen, just in terms of the trial, uh, if, in your view, is there something to be gained by the defense by, in a complicated fraud case, attempting to admit as much as possible of the Crown's case and getting on to the defense? Well, there's, there's no doubt about that. The, uh, it has always seemed to me that there are, even in a complicated uh, stock fraud, a stock manipulation or a corporate rape situation where you have an incredibly um, complicated series of transactions with notes and mortgages and the like backing up the purported manipulation of the treasury funds and so on. In any of these situations, uh, the issues can be reduced to one or two points uh, with all of the complications and with all of the paper that's flying around. And um, my experience in practice was that the best lawyers, best defense counsel, always admitted almost everything uh, except uh, those things which bore upon the central issues in the case because in front of the jury especially, and these cases very often are in front of juries, you want to de-emphasize uh, the importance of the evidence that's going before the jury. And if you allow the Crown to parade an endless succession of witnesses and accountants and economic experts who might be able to overwhelm the jury with data, raw data, uh, which may or may not have probative strength, that the, the jury are going to simply be overwhelmed by the numbers of witnesses and the numbers of documents, rather than by the real probative strength on the, on the central issues. And so that uh, I, I think that uh, the more agreements that defense counsel make on matters that uh, cannot be seriously in dispute, the better off they are in terms of the, the impact of the Crown case on the jury generally. That's a tactical matter. Doug, just uh, on the Crown side, do you have any uh, settled uh, approach in terms of the presentation of a complicated fraud case? Well, I think it can be of great benefit to the Crown if at the preliminary hearing stage you demonstrate the strength of the case. My approach depends to a certain extent on the lawyers involved uh, representing the accused. If the lawyer is serious about trying to narrow down the issues in advance and wants to come in and meet and maybe meet again and again and go over the documents, meet with uh, the forensic accountant if there is one so that he can explain what his evidence will be and the basis for it, then I'm, I'm delighted to attempt to narrow it down. But that's really the only basis on, on which I'll, I'll try, if it's all done in advance. 
there's a real danger in a fraud preliminary of, of cutting corners at the last moment without getting the necessary agreements with respect to facts. Sometimes frauds are difficult enough to establish without worrying about dispensing with certain evidence that uh, you might have drawn some benefit from. So if we can do all that in advance, uh, I'm quite prepared to proceed with a, uh, a bare bones case insofar as the witnesses are concerned and leave the, the rest to be uh, dealt with at trial. We put in an agreed statement and file exhibits, at least that then at the end of the, the Crown's evidence on the preliminary hearing, I'm in a position to argue that there ought to be a committal for trial. But if the lawyer who's representing the accused doesn't want to, to come in, I would just as soon prefer not to take time to try and coax them to come in and see what there is and, and uh, uh, in effect chase them and, and attempt to get a, a meeting set up. I'd just as soon proceed with the preliminary hearing as if it was a trial because I think you, you do a number of things. You're in a better position to impress the accused and counsel with the strength of the case when you put in a, a full, complete, cogent case you prepare your witnesses uh, and you shake some of the, the bugs out of their evidence at an early stage and you get some idea of where uh, the defenses are going to be coming from and, and clearly you, you prepare yourself. Uh, so in the absence of some well thought out and well planned effort on both sides to uh, shorten the preliminary hearing, I would just as soon run it as if it as if it was a trial. Judge Colleen, I, I don't want to be unfair, but uh, can I ask you this? Uh, does the You're never unfair, I'm sure. Does the addition of a jury in a complex and lengthy fraud trial make uh, a judge's task, which is otherwise difficult, uh, almost impossible? Well, uh, I've heard that story noised abroad by uh, judges uh, and lawyers uh, and by the public and you see it in the papers. My experience is no. Um, the classic experience that I've had in this area was a conspiracy trial down in London, uh, the Bevelin Building Products case, which is uh, I think still in the courts and at the appellate level. Uh, in that case, the charge was to uh, a conspiracy to defraud the public. The um, ingredients of the offense were that a company known as Bevelin Building Products Limited uh, allegedly had a province-wide scheme to sell uh, building products, primarily aluminum siding and uh, renovation materials, uh, which they would sell on the conspiratorial theory of the Crown to uh, elderly people, disadvantaged people, ill-educated people. So they were alleging a sophisticated province-wide uh, scheme to defraud the public aimed at that segment of the population, fertile and not so fertile octogenarians and the like. And uh, the principles in the fraud were the principles of the company and a series of salesmen who were moving out across the province spider-like to implement the conspiracy theory. Uh, Fourteen accused persons ended up charged with the, subst with the uh, conspiracy charge and a series of substantive counts related thereto. The, I ended up at the start of the trial with Crown Counsel telling me that the trial was going to take six months to a year. Um, he told me this well in advance because we had to empanel uh, 600 people to select our jury from because I was told that uh, the trial was going to be of that duration, therefore I felt that uh, properly considered with 14 accused and all the rights uh, of challenge, peremptory and otherwise, I felt that we had to have a large panel and also asked the panel uh, whether any or all of them wanted to uh, sit on the case for that length of time. And that was a difficult problem because we had to put the 600 people in different courtrooms in the building and bring them into one central courtroom uh, for the selection process. Well, we, we worked that out uh, with advanced planning. Two uh, defense counsel appeared at the opening of the trial, and there were 
Ten accused left by that point. Some had pleaded guilty, some had disappeared and the like. Uh, so I had to make an impassioned plea to the Bar of London uh, to come forward and help the other unrepresented accused. Well, that, that entrapped about four more lawyers and, but they said, well, yes, Your Honor, we would come into the case, but only for the purpose of arguing the admissibility of some of the evidence. We'll help the accused on that point, and then we'll bail out. Well, I said, that's fine. Uh, do that. At least help me to that extent. And so uh, then we moved on with the case. And as the case progressed, we had several counsel moving in and out. One counsel, Harold Stafford of infinite memory, uh, moved in and cross-examined witnesses which uh, witnesses who bore only on his clients involvement in the entire conspiracy and then he bailed out and then he came back at the end to address the jury and so this was what was going on a game of musical chairs but it worked in an orchest orchestrated fashion uh, I thought well another problem in the case there was mountains of wiretap evidence 223,800 square feet <laughs> of uh, wiretap tape material. The playing time of all of that was 1,492 hours. So we had to grapple with how we could get the relevant portions of those tapes in front of the jury in meaningful fashion, fair to the accused persons, fair to the Crown. And bear in mind, I'm left with seven unrepresented accused persons who had to pick, participate in the jury selection process and cross-examine witnesses and so on and the sensitivities of an accused person cross-examining, especially if he talks out the side of his mouth as some of these salesmen did, is a problem. <laughs> They're convicting themselves in their cross-examinations of the Crown witnesses and the problems for the trial judge are infinite in trying to impress upon those accused persons outside the hearing of the jury, that uh, really they had better be careful what they say in cross-examining witnesses because they may be hanging themselves. So I had that sensitivity problem. I had expert evidence from an accountant from Clarkson Gordon. What he did, here's the way the case went in. The fertile or not so fertile octogenarian would say, uh, salesman X came into my premises and talked me into signing a contract. Then a building contractor would testify that the contract which was sold at $10,000 was worth $2,000. Then um, the parents, children, and friends of the octogenarian would say that that person was sick and diseased and so on and ought not to have signed any contract in any circumstances. Then uh, the accountant would come in and give a summary of all the pertinent details of that transaction. So the accountant was moving in to the trial after all of the other witnesses had testified on these various substantive instances, instances which went to the proof of the conspiracy in whole or in part, showing the various fruits of the conspiracy. And so you had a melange and conjurie of, of evidence going in in that way. The accountant also analyzed two truckloads of documents seized from a warehouse in the head office of Bevlin Building Products and put that in the form of summaries for the jury so they might understand the 5,000 odd documents that were put in and marked as exhibits. So we had summaries in accordance with the Shield case. We had uh, transcripts of the wiretaps. We had to uh, allow the accused persons to hear some of the wiretap evidence because some of their lawyers had bailed out at the preliminary hearing and they were unrepresented at trial. A mountain of problems of those kinds. And then couple that with the fact that when we were at the stage of addressing the jury, uh, these people had to address the jury in their own ways, unrepresented. One of the accused persons was a charming gentleman from Montreal by the name of Max Morenstein. I will never forget him. He was a combination of Shecky Green, Myron Cohen, and Henry Youngman and in, in addressing the jury, and he gave the jury one of the great comedy hour presentations I have ever heard. <laughs> His opening lines to the jury were, were these. He said, ladies and gentlemen, I've heard all of this talk about fruits of the conspiracy. We'll need Anita Bryant here soon. 
then he went to the he went to an elderly gray-haired gentleman who was sitting in the front row of the jury box and this gentleman was about 70 a stern looking man who had never moved a muscle during the whole of the trial which I may add only took two months and not six or eight or twelve after we got things into shape and he looked at this man in the eye and he said you're not so tough are you <laughs> well What are you going to do but laugh? <laughs> he gave a, an address to the jury which was a sequence of one-liners for the, for the hour. I may add that the jury convicted every one of them. <laughs> but um, those are the kinds of problems. It's now in the Court of Appeal and they may reverse me, I understand, on something I said about conspiracy theories, but I don't know. So uh, with juries, with unrepresented accused persons, with wiretap evidence, and you very often have wiretap evidence in a massive fraud case, you've got a group of almost insurmountable problems at face. But when you go into them, when you get responsible counsel on both sides, they pale into insignificance, and if a trial judge, even in the situation that I faced, doesn't have enough counsel to help everybody out, you still can work out the problems with responsible Crown Counsel who, there, who are there after all to ensure a fair trial in the same way that uh, the judges and defense counsel are. So I, I give you that outline of that case because I think it had more problems than any case I had ever had in my life and I expect to have in my future life on the bench. And we were able to resolve all the problems including the forensic accounting problems because we had a superb forensic accountant who gave fair evidence and, um, and uh, it was understandable evidence. He spoke in layman's terms. And think of the problem of piping into the jury room the, tr the, uh, the actual recordings. Uh, my jury went out and, s and, and deliberated on this case for six days before they struck their uh, guilty verdicts on all accused. And they went about their task conscientiously reviewing all of the masses of transcripts as they bore upon each of the issues raised by counsel and uh, the documents and they found immense comfort I think in the accounting evidence which was so clear in its summary form and fair. We've used up our time on that note. Thank you very much. <laughs>